So thanks for Synthigo for the invitation to speak. Um, what I want to talk about today is our effort to use base editing to try and understand some of the complexities underlying cancer initiation, progression, and also therapeutic response. A lot of what I'll talk about will mirror some of the concepts that Emanuela opened the session with. Um, and uh, so we'll get into that in a little bit. I think the, the problem that we're really trying to address uh, is at two levels. The first is this, that mutation patterns in cancer are extremely complex. This is an print of the top 25 most mutated genes in colorectal cancer, where each column here is an individual patient's tumor. And you can see, obviously, that no individual tumor carries the same combination of mutations and also that the different the types of mutations that occur in each of these cancers in each gene are very different uh, as indicated by the colors. The second level of complexity that we're trying to understand is that within individual genes, the mutation patterns are also complex. Now, these are the three most common, uh, commonly mutated genes in colorectal cancer. APC occurs in over 80% of sporadic and familial colon cancers. P53 is very common, particularly in advanced disease, and KRAS is almost in 50% of cancers. They're, they're, I show these three examples not just because they're common, because they represent three different kinds of mutation patterns. APC is a classic tumor suppressor. We see lots of nonsense truncating mutations and very few missense alterations. P53, we see a wide variety of missense mutations with multiple hotspot mutations where we see piling up of individual mutations throughout the coding sequence. And KRAS is a classic oncogene where we see very uh, high accumulation of hotspot mutations, particularly at codons 12 and codons 13. Now we have anecdotal data from our lab as well as many other labs around the world that the types of mutations that you see in these genes not only have an impact on the way a tumor develops or whether a tumor develops at all, uh, but also the way they respond to uh, particularly molecularly targeted therapies. Um, we've seen this in APC, many examples in P53, and more recently through the development of new mouse models uh, in KRAS. So the, the anecdotal examples are great, but how do we um, ramp up and understand the enormous amount of complexity that we're dealing with in individual cancers and across the population? How do we do this at scale? Now, fortunately, from a modeling perspective, the mutations that we see in cancers are not completely random. Now, obviously, we, we get all different types of mutations, and these are, are due to underlying mutation signatures. Uh, some of which are, are not completely understood. But there is a, a significant piling up of mutations that are C to T transitions. Also, fortunately, we now, as of about five years ago, have tools to be able to try and mimic these mutations uh, in the dish. Now, this, um, I'm sure most of the people on the webinar are aware, is a, a CRISPR-based base editor. Um, this was pioneered by Alexis Comor and David Liu's group uh, in 2016, described the first cytosine-based editor that incorporated this APOBEC domain that allows you to, within a small window uh, of the guide targeting region, engineer specific C to C, C to T transitions uh, and create single nucleotide variants within genes designated by the targeting uh, by the guide RNA. So we wanted to use these tools to try and uh, understand cancer variants, not one at a time, um, but uh, at scale. So we took uh, MSK impact data, uh, of about 20,000 different tumors, pan cancer, um, and looked at mutations that occurred across all these uh, cases. And this encompasses about 460 um, cancer associated genes at the time of, of the data collection. Now we used an input file and built a computational pipeline that would uh, allow us to put the mutation file in and specify specific CAS and base editor enzyme properties, and then predict both in the human genome and the mouse genome, uh, which mutations could theoretically be modeled by cytosine base editors. And overall, uh, this allowed us to build um, design predictions for human and mouse of about half of the mutations that are seen, uh, again, pan cancer across this data set, encompassing missense, nonsense, and splice site mutations. In the mouse, the mutation number, as well as the number of guide RNAs that could theoretically make these mutations is smaller due to changes in codon usage uh, at the specific sites of these uh, mutations occur in humans. Now, rather than designing this library like a traditional CRISPR uh, pooled library with guide RNAs, we wanted to incorporate an additional feature um, which others have used often to, to build computational prediction pipelines. Uh, we call this a sensor coupled library, whereby the sgRNA um, is flanked downstream by its cognate genomic target uh, with genomic sequences either side of that target. 
And so when the sgRNA is expressed and, a, and an editor is provided, uh, it can target the same piece of DNA and you can amplify this entire thing uh, by PCR and sequence it and get a readout of the activity of the sgRNA rather than directly sequencing the target site. So we do this um, with multiple different enzymes. We see that we recapitulate many of the features that we know about base editors. This plot shows the um, percentage of C to T editing across the window of the uh, cytosine or the protospacer going back five bases and all the way through the protospacer. And we see high levels of activity between about positions three and positions nine of the base editor in these canonical enzymes. Here's one that en was engineered in our lab called FNLS. We see in en enzymes that have expanded windows, um, these extend out to about positions 12 or 13 of the protospacer. And this is not true of any given cytosine in the window. Uh, we see there's a strong dependence on the dinucleotide context or the uh, nucleotide that immediately precedes the target cytosine where TC dinucleotides um, are edited well across a wide range um, of, of the protospacer, whereas GC dinucleotides are not. And much of this has been described previously uh, as well. We see using this sensor-based approach um, expected features of targeting, whereby using canonical enzymes, we target sites that carry NGG PAMs, less so with NAG and NGA, unless you use uh, more PAM flexible enzymes like the NG uh, CAS enzyme, where you can less efficiently overall, but more broadly target uh, these PAM sites. Of course, none of this is really useful at all unless the, the editing site at the sensor recapitulates what's happening at the endogenous locus. And we took um, a number of examples from our data set and went and one by one engineered, tried to engineer these same mutations at the endogenous genomic site. This is data from uh, PC9 cells. And you can see in most cases, um, in more than 50% of these cases, the efficiency of editing at the sensor site is within about 10% of the endogenous site. And those that are not more often than not show higher levels of editing at the endogenous site uh, than at the sensor site. So uh, overall, we, are, we feel like we're predicting pretty accurately uh, the efficiency of these guides. And certainly within a number of guides that are targeting the same region, the ranking of those guides, while maybe different cell line to cell line, uh, stays pretty consistent. To make uh, this data useful um, to a number of people, as I said, we've scanned now uh, maybe 1,400 different mutations with over 6,000 guides. Um, we wanted to make this broadly useful for the community. So we built uh, a web app that contains both uh, sensor validated guides where you can go in and select specific attributes that you're looking at. So the species that you want to um, design guides against, the gene, whether you have a bias for a particular enzyme, whether you want to see a particular mutation and, and what kind of cell line we may have done it in and output these tables that have editing efficiencies. We also have a, a separate tab on this, which is a purely design tool. So these have not been sensor validated, but it's an expanded prediction set using a much larger range of Cas9 enzymes and base editing configurations, some of which don't even exist yet. Um, but given the speed of development of these tools, we predict will exist uh, in the near future. In this example, just showing, um, looking for one specific gene, P53, and there's more than 1,500 potential guides to engineer P53 mutations. The website also contains an, a, a lot of information about features of, of base editing enzymes. So the website address for this is down below, and we hope this will be useful to people to either design their own sensor libraries or clone individual guide RNAs. So one of the um, things we hope will this will enable is for people to just go and take guide RNA sequences off the shelf and go straight to do their important experiment rather than doing months and months of, of pre-validation. This is one example of doing this where we selected a range of P53 uh, targeting missense mutations across the, the P53 coding sequence. We selected these particular ones because from the sensor data, they showed a high level of editing purity they had sort of medium levels of actual cytosine editing, but the editing purity was very good, meaning it hit the target cytosine only and not many cytosines uh, around the window. We could then uh, take these guide RNAs, introduce them into pancreatic ductal epithelial cells that are P53 wild type, but contain an oncogenic KRAS mutation, transplant them without selection into the pancreas of a mouse and ask whether uh, tumors develop. And in each case from these pre-validated or sensor validated guide RNAs, uh, we got tumor development um, often reflecting the 
editing activity of the guide, because I mentioned these were not selected prior to implant. But when you look at the tumors that come out of these, um, uh, look at the cells that come out of these tumors, they have very high uh, levels of editing activity. And these are mixed populations. This is bulk tumor, so it contains immune cells and, and stromal cells. One of the other uses of these um, tools is actually to use the sensor library itself uh, to do functional screens. So in this case, we use the same cells. Um, these are PDEX cells expressing the FNLS base editor. We can introduce the mouse base editing library and then um, perform any kind of functional screen. In this case, we did the most simplistic screen you could imagine, which was just to put the library in and allow the cells to proliferate. So there's no real selective pressure other than uh, proliferation in the dish. And then you get two types of information out of these screens. You can calculate sgRNA enrichment. So whether you had um, low fitness variants or high fitness variants, in this case, proliferation as well as whether you saw editing at the surrogate sensor site, so whether the guide RNA was actually active. And then you can use both of these um, metrics to ultimately prioritize hits. Now, if we do this screen, you can see there's um, some depletion of some guides, but a very small number of guides show very high levels of enrichment. These happen to be, as you would expect, P53 guide RNAs. And if you focus just on the P53 guide RNAs that are in the library, you can see the ones that are enriched here are the ones that show high levels of C to T editing. So you already have some pre-validation that the hits you're getting in the screen are not really background noise, but are the ones that are causing editing. You can look at this data in another way by plotting the log fold change from day one to uh, day 30 in this case, and then uh, looking at how that log fold change um, com compares to the editing you see in the sensor. And this data, obviously, we see a lot of P53 guides. There are a number of other hits in here which we're following up. You also start to see guides that uh, showed high levels of editing in the sensor, but don't really show functional enrichment. And so these would be potential candidates to say these are P53 mutations that don't have a functional impact uh, on proliferation in this context. When you categorize this using the OncoKB um, classifier from MSKCC, you see that um, when we start with the guide RNAs, we have a number of known or predicted oncogenic mutations. After the screen is complete, those that don't show enrichment see a slight decrease in the known and oncogenic prediction uh, criteria. The ones that do show log fold enrichment have a slight enrichment of those known or, or oncogenic predicted um, mutations. But if you incorporate both the editing level and the log fold change, you get a much more uh, dramatic enrichment. And more than 70% of these mutations are either already known or predicted to be uh, oncogenic. So we have a, a large data set now, and I, I hope people will be able to use uh, the web tool there. We also need systems to be able to um, ask questions about cancer development in organisms, in, in complex cultures ex vivo. And to do this, uh, we've been developing a, a mouse tool, uh, which we're calling um, IBE, which is an inducible and reversible um, base editing mouse. And we're using an optimized base editor that we developed a few years ago, and this is through a, a tetracycline inducible uh, system in the mouse that we've used for many other um, applications in the past. The first steps to try and uh, cat uh, um, check that this mouse was working effectively was to uh, look at activity of the base editor across multiple different organ types. Um, as mentioned in the beginning, these are the three organ types that we're particularly interested in the lab, and we've been making organoids derived from these tissues, um, from these mice, to check editing. We did a first pass to look at editing activity using a fluorescent reporter that uh, we published uh, last year now that um, expresses a constitutively nuclear localized scarlet and then a, an inducible GFP, whereby cytosine editing creates the ATG start code on a GFP and allows GFP to come on. So if you look in this pancreas here, not treated with docs, you see constitutive scarlet, but no GFP. But just two days after docs induction, we see GFP now expressed. And the same is true in these docs treated small intestine uh, and basosphere derived organisms. Um, just to, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but there's been a, a concern going the last few years that induction of a high level induction of base editors um, can have really deleterious effects on cells, both at the sort of transient RNA editing level or the DNA editing level. We wanted to look at this because obviously we, we're trying to build cancer models. We don't want to have these collateral effects. Um, and so we took organoids here with the mucus reporter. Um, we activated with docs for either four days or eight days and then switched docs off at day four and looked at RNA editing. And to cut a long story short, we didn't see any evidence of RNA editing, um, whether the base editor was being expressed in these cells or not. And I think this is really due to the fact that we have a single copy integration of the enzyme 
we're not getting outrageous levels of the base editor. And this is actually consistent with some of the data that's already published um, on single cell analysis of RNA editing, where low expressions of the editor didn't cause RNA off target effects. So we've been using this in organoids. Um, we really um, would love to be able to genetically manipulate organoids and do this in multiple um, different configurations, do multiplexed editing. Um, when we don't add docs to these cells and we transfect them with either plasmid or synthetic guide RNA um, um, received from Synthago, we don't see any editing. So there's very little leakiness uh, of the base editor. When we transfect these cells on docs, we see some editing with plasma DNA, although in most cases, it's actually very low. With the synthetic guide RNAs, we've been able to get upwards of 90% editing activity with particular guides, um, whereas others uh, may be around 50%, but still very usable. I don't have the data to show you right now. We're waiting on more sequencing, but you can multiplex this. Um, we've gone up to about four guides now where you see efficient editing at each of those genomic loci uh, with four different guides. So um, you can also do this in vivo. Here we're using a liver model where we can deliver um, a MYC transgene on a Sleeping Beauty cassette, as well as sensor validated or sensor predicted guide RNAs by hydrodynamic tail vein injection. And when you do this in either with single um, um, sgRNAs that are cause um, liver cancer associated mutations like hotspot mutations in beta catenin, or with just naked synthetic sgRNA uh, from Synthago, you can develop uh, tumor models in vivo uh, using this, this mouse. So I'll finish there. And I just want to uh, thank the people involved. Uh, Bianca Diaz was, and Ted Kassenhuber and, and Francisco Sanchez Rivera really spearheaded the base editing sensor library validation. Uh, and Alina Caddy has been driving the uh, inducible base editing mouse. And just a quick plug for uh, Francisco, who's heading off to start his own lab at, at MIT in a couple of months. Um, I'm sure he'd love to hear from you if you're interested in continuing some of this work. Oh, thank you so much for that talk, Dr. Dow. Um, there are a lot of questions for you in the chat. I'm just going to pick one out if we can get through it kind of quickly. Um, one of the mem audience members wants to know, what are the ramifications of your C to T analyses on current approaches to next-gen sequencing and therapeutic approach in cancer? Ooh, um I'm not sure how to answer that. Um, okay, yeah. maybe we can take that one to the chat. And it's kind of a big, a big question, yeah. a lot of implications. Okay. Um, well, a simpler question then: How long do you follow the mice in these studies? Uh, yeah, the mice. It's really dependent on the tumor model. So, in the liver model, um, they can get sick anywhere from four weeks to twelve weeks, and that can be due to the level of editing um, or the um, efficiency of the guide. Um, or the transgenes that you deliver. So if you deliver combinations, they often come down faster than with uh, individual guide RNAs. Mm -hmm.